All right, this is part two of the review of imperialism. So the first place we're going to take a look at that was a target of European imperialism was Africa, the African continent. Um, as you might recall, or at least you should recall from ninth grade, there had been a lot of contact between Europe and Africa um, because if you remember with triangle trade, the transatlantic slave trade, um, so European, uh, there had been some Europeans who had made contact in Africa. Um, there were some settlements in Africa, but there, um, the the main settlement that uh, European settlement in Africa was in South Africa. That was with the Boers, B-O-E-R-S. Okay, those are Dutch farmers who uh, settled there. The later, um, they are going to come in contact with the British. The British are going to want to take over South Africa. That is going to lead to the Boer War. In addition, um, this area of South Africa and, and a little north of that is Zulu territory. So the British and the Boers also had some conflict with the Zulu under the, and the Zulus were under the military command of Shaka, that was their leader. Um, and Shaka was actually very successful holding off both the British and the Boers. Um, unfortunately, once uh, Shaka passed, the, the other people who took over after him weren't as effective. So the, the Zulu ended up retreating into, uh, it, retreating kind of north and left the territory. Um, the British and the Boer fought. That was known as the Boer War. And the British win the Boer War. All right. And so South Africa becomes a, a British colony. But, um, and, and like I said, there were, but there were other small, like I said, there was contact through the, uh, through the, uh, slave trade, but you may be asking yourself, well, um, in every other part of the world, you know, when the Europeans had contact with, uh, Canada, with um, the, what is now known as the United States, South America, um, you know, they had, they had colonized those areas. That was way back in the 1700s and the 1800s. Why wasn't Africa ever colonized? And the main thing that, that kept the, ba basically what kept the Europeans out was geography. Uh, the geography of Africa was really, really difficult. Uh, first, it has, it has uh, very few navigable rivers. So what do I mean by that? Navigable sounds like the word navigate. Um, it means there are rivers that you can't travel on. So, you know, you might have a, a river that goes for a little while, but then either, you know, it's going to have waterfalls, it's going to, you know, get very, very shallow and turn into rapids, what have you. So you, you can't travel by river. There's also, remember, they have the Sahara Desert that runs through it. Um, there's also rainforest, there's jungle areas. So uh, there's the Great Rift Valley. I mean, there's a lot of geographic obstacles that kept Europeans on the coast. But what happens is during this period of imperialism, remember, imperialism follows the Industrial Revolution. And thanks to the Industrial Revolution, um, Europeans are able to deal with these challenges. So, you know, for example, they can build roads and use cars. They can lay down train tracks and use railroad cars. They have modern medicines, things like quinine, to deal with the diseases that were spreading through Africa. And so um, suddenly now um, Africa is kind of ripe for conquest. And there was great potential for warfare. So what happens is um, there is this meeting known as the Berlin Conference. And you should know Berlin is a city in Germany. That's why it should sound familiar. But um, at this conference, all the European leaders meet and they decide how they are going to divide up Africa. Suffice to say, there are no Africans at this conference. Nobody asks the Africans what they want. The Europeans say, I'll take this chunk, you'll take this chunk. You can take a look at the map key. You can see that territory is marked for Germany, the Portuguese, the Belgians, the French, the British, uh, the Spanish. And there are only a few spots that remain independent. We'll talk about those. But really, the, the independent parts of Africa are the exception. They are not the rule. The majority of this... Uh, continent will be imperialized. And it's a very rapid transition from uh, independent to imperialized. And this period of rapid uh, imperialism is known as the scramble for Africa. That's what this era is known as. All right. So 
Um, what happens is, is, but like I said, the Europeans are meeting in Africa and they are deciding how they would divide up Africa. And that has a lot of long-term consequences because what the Europeans do is they set up what is known as artificial barriers, right? Uh, sorry, artificial borders, rather, my mistake. Artificial borders. What do I mean by that? If you remember our lesson on nationalism, you can remember that I talked to you a little bit about uh, nation states. The fact that if you looked for French people, you'd go to France. If you look for Italians, you can go to Italy and so on and so forth. That the borders are, you know, lines drawn on a map and the nationalities, the people, that's, they, they don't necessarily mean the same thing. In Africa, this is a situation where the lines drawn on the map have nothing to do with the people who live in Africa. The lines on the map have nothing to do with the people who live in Africa. I'm going to show you a picture. If you look at the picture all the way to the left, that shows you if, if Africa was divided based on ethnic groups, if it was like the same way Europe is divided, you know, Europe is divided, the Spanish people live in Spain, the Portuguese people live in Portugal, the French people live in France, and so on and so forth. If Africa was divided up that way, you know, the Zulus live here, the Bantu live here, and you know, so on and so forth, Africa would look, the borders of Africa would look like the, the picture on the left. Instead, Europeans divided up Africa with no regard to who lived there. They just divided it up however they want. And I mean, coincidentally, that's how you get so many straight lines on the map. Um, and so they divide up Africa. And like I said, it's artificial. It's an artificial division. And by the way, I've had some students ask me, they were like, oh, but you couldn't have countries that small, which is ridiculous. Because if you look at Europe, there are many, many teeny tiny, like Switzerland and little, there's tiny countries all over Europe. So that's never an issue. And you have to remember too, um, if you look at the picture all the way at the top right, sometimes we, it's hard to um, understand the scale of Africa and how large it is. But that, that picture at the top gives you a good idea. The fact that you could fit United States, China, India, Eastern, all of Eastern Europe, Italy, and all of these countries inside Africa, that gives you an idea of how very, very large this territory is and how many nations, how many people, how many ethnic groups had, had um, um, how many ethnic groups are, are in there. Um, but you can see that, again, the ethnic boundaries all the way on the left, if you look at the borders today, which is the picture at the bottom right, you can see that the borders today look more like the borders set up after the Berlin Conference than they do based on ethnic groups. They have more in common with the borders set up after the Berlin Conference than they do with ethnic groups. And that's had a lot of long-term consequences because when you shove different people together in one country, you're not gonna have the same kind of social cohesion. You're not gonna have a cohesion. Like you're not gonna have, um, people aren't gonna wanna live together in peace and harmony. It's harder for people to live together in peace. They don't necessarily have things in common that's gonna bring them together. And that's had long-term consequences in Africa. All right, so let's get back to the other slide. All right, so we talked about South Africa. We talked about the artificial borders. The next thing I wanna talk about is on the top right. That's Congo, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. You can see that, that's in the center of Africa there. Um, this is an area that was controlled by Belgium, but more specifically, this, this territory was owned by King Leopold of, of Belgium. And it's pretty infamous because he ran this area of land as if it was his own private property. What he did was, is he forced the native people to harvest rubber, all right? And they had no choice. He, they used, as you can see, they, people were held at gunpoint, that he had, uh, you know, bands of people that reported to him, they would threaten people's lives, they would uh, rape women, they would hold families hostage and force the men to go out and harvest rubber, they had certain quotas that they had to fill, if they didn't get enough rubber, that one of the punishments is, I don't know if you can see in the picture, how the people got their hands cut off, sometimes children, uh, it was just horrific. 
Um, at the time that the Congo, which is a nation of, you know, over a million people, um, when Congo, because, uh, like I said, the way the country was run, there was no very little education, very little social services offered to the people. When Congo gets independence, in entire in, within the entire nation, only sixteen, one six, only about sixteen people in the entire country have a college education. All right, it, the number might even be lower. I got to double check it, but it's a very very small number of people um, who have any kind of higher education because the, the, it was just the human rights violations that are obscene. All right, so that's an example of um, just really abusive situation in the Congo. Another one I can talk about really quickly is in the top left. That's Algeria. Um, that's in North Africa. Um, Algeria is an interesting example because the French, as opposed to, if you remember the different types of imperialism that we discussed, there usually a lot of countries would um, use indirect control. Right. This is where you would leave the local leaders in charge and um, you would kind of you would run the country through. You would leave local leaders in place and just have them kind of carry out your orders as necessary. Algeria wasn't like that. Um, Algeria, France wanted Algeria to be like a, an extension of the French homeland. So uh, this was this was a place where it was direct control where French people ran the entire government, where they forced the people of Algeria to accept French culture. They had to speak French. Um, all of the land, any good quality land was actually given to French people. There was a lot of French people who moved to Algeria to settle there, and this was a place for their excess population. So um, that, it led to civil war that you know went on for hundreds of years, very, very violent, the, uh, the civil wars throughout Algeria. All right, the last thing I want to talk about before we finish up is Ethiopia. That's here on the right side of the map. Ethiopia is one of those exceptions to the rule. Ethiopia is able to maintain its independence during the scramble for Africa. Um, basically, the two notable countries that stay independent is Liberia and Ethiopia. Liberia, if you get from the name. The name comes from the word liberty. Liberia was set up as a home for slaves, um, ex-slaves from the United States, you know, that wanted to return to Africa. Um, so Liberia was under the protection of the United States. So that's why it remained independent. But Ethiopia remains independent thanks to the work of its emperor, Emperor Menelik II. He is able to turn the European powers against each other. He's able to play them off each other. Um, he's able to get modern weapons and buy modern weapons for his armies. And he is able to defeat, his army is able to defeat Italy. And so he keeps Italy from being able to take over the country. And that is how Ethiopia remains independent during this period. Now, just so you know, it is a temporary situation because in World War II, um, there's going to be fighting. And then if you, the, the leader of Africa during, I'm sorry, the leader of Italy during World War II is a man by the name of Mussolini, good friends with Hitler. Um, he is going to conquer Ethiopia during that period. But until then, Ethiopia does remain independent. Ethiopia remains independent. All right. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about, I think, oh no, I'm going to talk a little bit more. Um, uh, this is one of the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, the, one other country that we really should cover um, is the country of Rwanda. Rwanda is another country in Africa. Um, Rwanda was also colonized by the Belgians. And what happens is, is uh, Rwanda is one of these countries where it is made up of multiple, a few different ethnic groups. The two main tribal groups that are in Rwanda are the Hutus and the Tutsis, all right? And the majority of the population is Hutu, but it is the Tutsis that the Belgians favor. So uh, when there were certain jobs in the government, things like that, usually the Tutsis were able to get certain benefits from the government. Um, the, certainly they, the claim was made that Tutsis have features that are more European looking. 
and they're like lighter skin and narrower noses. And therefore, if you remember when we talked about social Darwinism, the thought was these, you know, were higher class Africans. And so they had certain benefits. So naturally the, an the anger, the animosity, the, 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 the hatred between the Hutus and the Tutsis gets worse. And they kind of play into that. Um, uh, the, that's a way that the, Belgians can maintain control. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we go into India. This is this technique known as divide and rule. That as long as you get the two different groups of natives fighting against each other, it's going to keep the native people from working together to overthrow the imperialists. So anyway, so like I said, you have this situation where this is Rwanda has been imperialized and ethnic groups inside the country hate each other. But Rwanda, the Belgians are able to keep peace. They have the military equipment to, to keep the violence you know, from, from breaking out. Anyway, um, what happens is, is eventually, um, and this is, we're going to talk about this later in the year, but eventually Rwanda is going to be able to become independent and the Belgians will leave. And this is kind of one of those long-term impacts of these artificial borders is because you've shoved all these different people together and there's this anger and the, and the, the anger and the hatred between these groups, once the imperialists leave, a lot of times this, this anger can break into massive violence. And the Rwandan genocide is one example of this. What happens is, is um, after the imperialists leave, they elect a new government. So naturally, the Hutus are the majority of the population, so a Hutu president is elected. And what happens is, is there's some, his, after he's elected, his plane is, it comes down, it's like shot down, it, it crashes. So there is some debate over how this happened. I mean, obviously the Hutus blame the Tutsis for it. He's a Hutu, you're a Tutsi, so therefore you took him out. Um, there's others who claim that in fact, it was the Hutus themselves that shot down the plane because this Hutu president had been making a lot of concessions. He had made positions available to the Tutsis. He was trying to unify the cultures and some Hutus didn't like him. They thought he was too nice and too kind to the Tutsis. So at this point, it's still an open case. No one knows who shot, his, who shot down the, the Hutu president. What is important is that this crash is basically the spark that leads to the Rwandan genocide. Because what happens is, is you end up having these radio broadcasts where Hutus tell them we have to kill the cockroaches. The time has come to kill the cockroaches and things like that. And literally violence breaks out throughout the country. And you have Hutu mobs, as you can see in these middle pictures, where they just take out their own machetes and they just come out of the houses and they literally just find and kill all the Tutsis they can. And I'm talking men, women, children, they come into your house, they come into your business and just, there is no protection just for days. They just are just killing people. As you can see in the picture in the top left, this is there, this is all over Rwanda is just people dying and being killed in this, in this genocide. Um, and you know, on the bottom left, you can see these are where people obviously leave Rwanda and they become, um, they become, um, uh, uh, refugees trying to flee the violence. Anyway, if you want to learn a little bit more about the Rwandan genocide, I, I do recommend watching Hotel Rwanda. It's a great movie. Um, because most people didn't even know that much about the Rwandan genocide. It really, it wasn't a well-known genocide until this movie came out. And then people, um, uh, got, uh, uh, that's how most um, of the people of the world really became familiar with this genocide is through that movie. Um, it, I mean, it's not 100% accurate. Some of the things were dramatized for, for the movie, but the general, you know, very general, the general sense of it is, is accurate. All right, um, we're going to go over one other area and then I'm going to end the, this video and then I'm going to do a separate part three. Um, the last thing I want to talk about before I break is imperialism in India. I'm going to try to do this pretty quick. Um, India is considered the jewel of the British Empire. The British Empire is huge, okay? Britain has the largest empire ever um, in history. It has the largest empire. It's said that the sun never sets on the British Empire because literally 
there, um, every piece of the globe, every continent on the globe, except for like Antarctica, you know, England has some, has a colony somewhere on, on one, every continent. And literally no matter where you go, no matter, you know, what time it is, some part of the British Empire is in daylight. Anyway, um, so, but out of this huge massive empire, India is considered the jewel of the crown. It's their most important possession. And that makes sense because again, remember, the major drivers, the major reason why people would imperialize is to get raw materials and to get markets for their goods. Remember, the economic drivers of imperialism are to get raw materials and be a market for goods. And India has that both. It is, um, it has a great fertile farmland. It produced a lot of cash crops for Britain. In addition, it also, it has a very large population. So that's a lot of people buying British goods. One of the main British goods was textiles at this point. If you remember from the industrial revolution in England, they opened a lot of textile mills. The textile just means fabric, a lot of mills to make fabric. And what happened is before the industrial revolution, India had actually been one of the largest textile manufacturers. So when England imperializes India, not only do they force the Indian people to buy British cloth, they also tax Indian industries to, be, to make sure that the Indian businesses go out of business, that they can basically wipe out their greatest competitor. So it really, so that's uh, one of the reasons why India makes England so much money as a colony. All right, so um, it, the other, the reason why the British were able to successfully control India um, is they ruled it as a protectorate. India was an, as a protectorate. So that means that they left the local leaders in charge and there were very few British citizens to control millions of Indians. There's millions of Indians and they far outnumbered the British. So why didn't the Indians get rid of the British and send them packing? Well, the reason is for this idea right here on the upper right. It's called divide and rule. What happens is, is again, this is something that the imperialists did to help them maintain control. As long as groups inside India are too busy fighting each other, they will never be able to work together to get rid of the British. Does that sound right? As long as the people inside the country are too busy fighting each other, they're not going to work together to fight the British. So, for example, if you remember, in India they have, they, uh, most of the, the majority of the population are Hindu. And if you remember, one of the biggest, most important things in Hinduism is the caste system, right? So there was animosity, there was anger, hatred between the high caste Indians and the low caste Indians, okay? So the high caste Indians would not work with the low caste Indians. In addition, the British government gives the high caste Indians more job opportunities. They have chances to work in the government. They have chances to work um, to be soldiers in the army. They have a lot of benefits that lower caste Indians don't. So that's going to keep these higher caste Indians um, happy with British rule. Um, you have people who are Indians who are thrilled to be part of the British Empire. They are proud to be members of the British Empire. They have access to education. They're getting railroad cars that are running through. They're getting good jobs. And as long as there's a big chunk of the population that's happy with the rule, the fact that they cause starvation, the fact that they're taking craftsmen and running them out of business, it there it, it's 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 okay because you have this other group of the population so he's going to be on your side they keep um there's also animosity there's also anger between hindus and muslims so hindus and muslims won't get along um hindus and muslims won't get along with the sikh population uh, there's just so many differences in language in religion in caste that all of these groups there's there's the Indian people won't work together. They're not going to bond together. So that 
makes ruling India as an imperialist, as an outsider, much easier. All right, so um, as I said, uh, one of the great jobs that you could get, a really high paying, high status job you could get, was being a soldier in the British Army in India. And these soldiers, these Indian soldiers in the British Army were known as Sepoy, S-E-P-O-Y. Okay, that's there on the left. Um, and what happens is, is there is this moment, and this is considered the start of the Indian independence movement. And it starts with the Sepoy Rebellion, otherwise known as the Sepoy Mutiny, and has a couple other names, but just know, Sepoy Rebellion. And um, in this event, what happens is, is the Sepoy is made up of many different religions. Um, but most, many of the soldiers are either Hindu or Muslim. Okay, uh, and if you remember, both of those religions have strict rules about what you can eat. Hindus cannot eat beef, cannot eat anything from a cow. Hindus, oh sorry, did I just say, yeah, Hindus can't eat anything from a cow. D yeah, I screwed that up, sorry, my mistake. Hindus can't eat anything from a cow, all right, they can't eat beef any kind of steak, any of that kind of stuff. Hindus can't eat cow. Muslims, people who practice Islam, cannot eat pork, right? No pork, nothing from the pig, all right? Um, long story short, oh, goodness gracious, I hope you guys remember the story. This is where the Sepoy soldiers ended up getting new guns, and these guns um, had this new firing mechanism where you would take this little cartridge and it was like, it had like a paper cartridge and inside the cartridge was gunpowder and a bullet. And the way it worked was you would put this cartridge in your mouth, rip it open and push this cartridge into your gun. And then you could shoot and it made this whole process much faster. And, you, and then you have to shoot again, you take out a cartridge, you rip it open with your mouth, shove it into the gun and shoot. What happens is, is to be able to get the cartridge to go into the gun, you have to grease the cartridge to be able to let it slide in and out of the gun quickly. And the story went out that the grease used on the cartridge was made from the fat of cows and pigs. Now, just to be clear, the British deny that this is the truth. The Indians 100% believe this is the truth. I'm not sure what the reality is. What's important to know is that the Sepoy soldiers absolutely believe this to be true. They absolutely believe that these cartridges are covered in pork and, and, and beef and, and cow fat. And because of that, this is a moment where their anger, where the anger of the Hindus and the Muslims, uh, their anger towards the British is greater than their anger for each other. So suddenly you have Hindu and Muslim soldiers who are willing to work together to fight the British. And this rebellion spreads. It spreads throughout a big chunk of India. It's a lot of violence. It took a lot to come down uh, to break this, um, this mutiny. But the mutiny is not successful. It lasts for quite some time, but it is not successful. Um, there wasn't good leadership for the rebellion. The uh, Mughal emperors, the Mughal princes didn't want to, they were happy to be led by the British. They, they were doing well under British rule. They didn't want to upset the apple cart. You also had a lot of Sikh soldiers who did not, um, they were again happy with British rule. They, they didn't have a problem with the Greece. So um, for a couple of different reasons, the mutiny is not successful. However, the mutiny does change the relationship between India and Britain suddenly now the British take a much stronger, um, they take a, a much more direct role in uh, managing the, the colony. Um, the, uh, and what we see in India is the start of a, um, the start of Indian nationalism where people start to feel proud of being British. 
All right. And so you see the foundation of two nationalist groups. The big nationalist groups are the Indian National Congress, which is made up of Hindus, and then the Muslim League, which naturally is made of Muslims. So again, even in that, these two groups will not work together. And the Hindus and Muslims don't work together to, for independence until, um, until we get to Gandhi. And Gandhi is the one who's going to be able to get everybody in India to work together to overthrow the British. Last thing I want to get to really quick is the importance of the Suez Canal. You can see that at the bottom of the page. The Suez Canal in Egypt is really, it is strategically critical for the British to be able to control their empire. Um, usually if the British, before the that Suez Canal was built, you would have to leave Britain go south of Africa, go all the way around the bottom of Africa before you could come up to India. So that's a three month journey. So that means one way is three months, three months back, six months to go there and back. Once the Suez Canal is built, it is three weeks from London to get to India and then three weeks back. And then obviously to try to travel all the way to China and things like that also is, is much quicker. Um, what ends up happening is in the Sue in Egypt, um, the way the Suez Canal is built is Egypt borrows a lot of money from European bankers to build the Suez Canal, as well as to have some irrigation projects um, to allow it to industrialize. Um, and long story short, Egypt is not able to pay back the loans, and therefore the British and the French, the, the British are able to take possession of the canal. So the Suez Canal is under the ownership of the British, so it, that's a form of economic imperialism. They didn't have to conquer them with soldiers, they conquered them basically with money, by lending them money that these guys couldn't pay back. All right, with that, I'm going to take a break. Please be sure to tune in for um, part three, where we're going to go over uh, imperialism in China.